Chapter 1 A Dakota Boy The half-grown boys and the dogs of the Indian villages are the greatest pests it has been my fortune to meet. Very dirty, very ugly, and very mischievous. Frank Meyer, 1851 They told me that their nation had always lived in the valley of Mississippi, that their wise men had asserted this for ages past. Mary Eastman, 1849 When the boy called Chaska was born, his family lived on the eastern shore of the Mississippi River, just south of present-day St. Paul, Minnesota. It's likely he was born there, in the village of Kaposia. Kaposia was where his family stayed the longest in any given year. It was where the women planted corn in the summer, and where they lived in lodges made from tree bark. The name Kaposia means traveling light, and the people were often on the move. They were always looking for good places to hunt for deer or gather food like the wild rice that grew in Minnesota lakes. When Chaska was very young, he traveled in a diaper of soft deer skin, lined with the fuzz of a cattail. His mother carried him over her back in a cradle board, a kind of backpack with a rigid wooden frame. When she gathered wood, she might prop the cradle board against a tree trunk or hang it from a grapevine so Chaska could entertain himself by watching the birds. When the whole village picked up and moved to their fall and winter hunting grounds along the St. Croix River, Chasco's cradle board was hung along the side of a horse, a bundle of blankets on the other side to balance the load. As he grew older, he saw the trail to the northern lakes from the top of a fully loaded trevois, a kind of sled made from long wooden poles and harnessed to a pack animal, sometimes a dog. As long as that animal kept to the trail, Chaska had an easy ride. But every so often, at the whiff of a fox or a rabbit, a dog might pull a travoy deep into the woods. During those early travels in a cradle board, on a travois or on foot, Chaska came to know the cycles of the year. Throughout all the moons, or Dakota months, Chaska and his family traveled from place to place. They looked for spots to camp with plenty of food and firewood nearby. Late in fall, in Takiyuhawi, the moon when deer mated, they left Kaposia and headed north, searching for deer tracks in the snow. Men hunted for deer and other game, while women put up elk or buffalo skin teepees and made them snug against the cold, whistling winds of Takapsunwi, the moon when bucks lost their horns, and the midday sun shone feebly. In the hard moon of Wee, when the deer were so thin they were hardly worth hunting, Chaska's people headed back to a spot near Kaposia. They dug up corn or rice sealed in bark barrels and stored in shallow holes at the village. They fished in the river through holes in the ice, and together they waded through the worst of the winter. As long as the fall hunt had been successful and there were plenty to eat, the Kaposia band could look forward to a comfortable late winter and spring. Chaska watched men fix traps for muskrats and make shot for their hunting guns. He watched women scrape and smoke deer hides until they were soft and supple, yet strong. And during Ista Wikeazanwi, the moon of sore eyes, when winds blasted down and kept the smoke from the wood fire inside his family's teepee, he listened to stories of past hunts and past winters spent along the rivers and woods and hills. When spring finally came in the month of Watopapiwi, when the rivers and streams were free of ice, Chaska helped his fathers and uncles and older cousins. They were getting ready for the long trip west to the lakes where muskrats lived. Chaska was too young to go. Instead, he joined the women going to the sugar bush, a place where many maple trees grew. Boys and girls and women worked together at the sugar bush to gather sap from the trees and boil it down to thick golden brown sugar. Women and girls tapped the trees 
and gathered wood for the fires. Boys, like Chasco, guarded the syrup as it turned into sugar and fought off hungry chipmunks, rabbits, and squirrels. Most of the men hunted with guns or spears, but Chaska and the other boys stocked their prey with old-fashioned bow and arrows. Chaska had probably owned his set since he was old enough to hold it in his hands. Days and months and years of practice made Dakota boys good shots. After preparing the maple sugar, everyone headed home to Kaposia, where the men would soon join them their packs piled high with muskrat pelts. As soon as the wild strawberries turned red, during the month, Wazupi, Gui, Chaska's mother, and other women of Kaposia started planting corn. Among the Dakota, farming was women's work, but boys were expected to help in the fields, especially late in summer when red-winged blackbirds tried to peck at the ripening ears of corn. The boys helped their mothers and grandmothers build wooden platforms in the field. Then they sat on top to keep watch for flocks of blackbirds, letting out cries and whoops when the birds tried to come near the corn. On lazy summer days, between blackbird attacks, Chaska dozed in the heat of Wazute Kasawi, the month of hoeing corn, and listened to stories his mother or grandmother, sitting below in the shade of the platform, might tell. Once they had gathered the ripe corn during the month of Wasutonwi, Chaska and his people prepared for fall. Women and children headed north to lakes where wild rice and cranberries grew. In Wazupiwi, the moon for drying rice, they worked together to preserve the harvest for winter. Soon the men headed out again for the fall deer hunt. All day long, Chaska waited for the hunters to return to camp. He hoped to be the first, first to catch sight of them, so he could call out, Woo -hoo, hoo That let everyone know that freshly killed deer was on its way. There would be feasting that night. If a lucky hunter brought a bear, Chaska shouted, Wah! 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 Chaska and the other boys kept shouting and hollering until all the hunters had returned. Dakota men were great hunters. They had to be if their people were to have plenty to eat and deerskin to fashion into warm buckskin moccasins. Chaska only had to feel hungry for a few days during a bad hunt to realize that he wanted to be a great hunter too. In the early 1880s, the land around Chaska's home was full of squirrels, chipmunks, red fox, rabbits, and deer. Rivers and streams were teeming with wall-eyed pike. Learning to track deer on foot or to spear fish through river ice might be hard work, but Dakota boys made it seem like a game. Each trip into the woods revealed new secrets of the natural world. Armed with a bow and arrow for hunting and a pole with horsehair line for fishing, Chaska walked lightly, observing everything around him. The leaves that were disturbed around the particular tree showed that a deer had made its bed there, or perhaps a bear had been scratching for roots. Chaska didn't always know what the clues meant, but his searching taught him about the animals of the forest, how they lived and slept, and how a good hunter might track them. When Chaska saw rabbit tracks in the morning grass, he scattered piles of sharply pointed burrs on the ground. The next morning, he hoped to find a sad-looking rabbit stopped by the burrs stuck in its feet. This didn't work. He gathered his burrs and tried again. Older relatives helped Chaska when he needed it. One taught him how to make bows and arrows. Another shared his skill in shooting. Still others helped Chaska memorize the habits and ways of animals. Being a good hunter meant more than knowing how to shoot. It meant being so close to nature that you knew, deep down, where animals gathered. Stories told around the nighttime fire helped Chaska understand that even animals like the wolf or Shontontika had much to teach him. A wise father would tell his son, Follow the examples of the Shontukika, 
when he is surprised and runs for his life, he will pause to take one more look at you before he enters his final retreat. So you must take a second look at everything you see. Chaska also had to be brave, and he had to know how to force his body to survive long, hard days of hunting. Most likely, his father, Joaquin Yantanka, or Big Thunder, was his first teacher. Early in the morning, Joaquin Yantanka might rouse Chaska from his sleep and challenge him to fast for the day. Chaska needed to know how to maintain his strength without food if someday he was to join the men hunting. Fasting would help make him brave, especially since he had to endure the taunts of the other boys at Kaposia as they grabbed tasty bits of stew and ate right in front of him. But Chaska didn't let the taunting get to him. He taunted them right back on their fasting days, and he joined their games on days when learning to hunt seemed less important than testing a sled on a snow-covered hill. In the winter, when the cold deepened, Dakota boys built sleds from long, narrow strips of bark. Boys challenged each other to go down the steepest, most tree-covered hills. They skated the rivers, too, wearing smaller strips of bark tied to their moccasined feet. Skating was fun and safe, as long as the ice held. But when the sun began to shine more strongly in the spring, river and lake ice started to crack and boom. One year, on a late winter day, a boy fell through the ice into cold, cold water. Chaska tied one end of a pack line to a tree on the shore and threw the other to his friend. Then, when it seemed the river might still pull the boy under, Chaska jumped in and pulled the boy ashore. Although still young, Chaska was earning a reputation for bravery and strength. He hoped to make his father and village proud of him. But sometimes it seemed as though he didn't belong at Kaposha. Chaska's mother, Minio Kadawin, or Women Planting in Water, came from Wabasha's village, far down the Mississippi River. Men from Kaposha often chose wives from other villages and brought them to Kaposha. But Chaska's mother didn't stay. When Chaska was still young, she went back to her own people. Since then, Wakanyatanka had married again, and Chaska was surrounded by much younger half-brothers and sisters. They made a bark lodge feel crowded and were too little to be much fun to play with. But even if he felt out of place, Chaska didn't ignore his relatives. No one could and still be Dakota. In a Dakota village, nearly everyone was related. Chaska had many fathers, since the Dakota considered all of his father's brothers to be his father too. All of his mother's sisters were also mothers to him. Children whom white visitors would have called Chaska's cousins, he naturally called his brothers and sisters. Chaska's family extended well beyond the cozy lodge he shared with his grandparents, parents, and brothers and sisters. Everywhere he went, Chaska found relatives. If he were to meet someone, like a white man, who wasn't somehow related, he could still make him part of the family by claiming him as a brother or a cousin. The Dakota had always viewed family this way. They trusted that family would see them through hard times. Grandparents, who were often children's first teachers, told young hunters like Chaska, Give food! Give food unstingingly! Let nothing be held in reserve for one alone. When all food is gone, then we shall honorably starve together. Let us still be Dakotas. So Chaska learned to share the rabbits he trapped and the fish he caught. In the Dakota way of thinking, everything he gave away would eventually flow back to him. The Dakota way of life depended on family and relatives caring for each other. In many ways, Chaska was just one of many sons or brothers at Kaposia. But in other ways, he was special. He was the oldest grandson of the leader, Sentanwakamani. After Chaska's father, Wakanyantanka, had his time as leader, Chaska expected to become leader himself. As leader, he wouldn't live in a better lodge or teepee. Dakota leaders didn't eat better than the others in the village, and they didn't have better horses or clothes. 
Their power didn't come from the things they had, but how often from the things they gave away. Sintan Wakanmani gained power by making sure that all in the village had enough to eat and warm shelter for winter. He gained influence by being good to relatives and by being good to the village. As leader, Chaska's grandfather knew how to listen well. The Dakota made their decisions together in meetings called councils. Over hours or days or weeks, they met to discuss major decisions. The leader did his best to listen to and sort through all the different views. His job was to make clear the decisions his people had reached, not to tell his people what to do. About the time that Chaska's grandfather became leader of the Kaposia band, Dakota leaders began to take on a new role. White people were moving into Dakota lands. Some were French speaking and many more were English speaking. The Dakota called them Basiku. The name didn't mean white exactly, but it referred to beings who were very efficient and had odd, almost magical powers. The Wasiku didn't see the point in spending hours and days in council when one man could make a good decision quickly and efficiently. They came to village leaders whenever they had something important to discuss. The first Wasiku was something important to discuss was Santan Wakanmani was Lieutenant Zevilon Montgomery Pike of the United States Army. He came to Kaposia on September 23, 1805, a few years before Chaska was born. Pike was looking for land on which to build a frontier fort. Not far from Kaposia, he found what he wanted. For about 100,000 acres of land, Pike paid Santan Wakamani and, other, and another leader $250 in gifts, which they promptly gave to their villages. Sentan Wakanmani didn't think of the land the way the Wasiku people did, as something to be bought and sold. He did not know that Pike told other whites he'd gotten the land for a song. Sentan Wakanmani would not have agreed to Pike's fort if he hadn't believed that the people of Kaposia would welcome it. But Sentan Wakanmani did not understand what changes white people would bring. At first, when Chaska was very young, little changed around Kaposia. People hunted and fished and gathered wild rice, as they always had. In good years, they sold furs to traders. In bad years, they went hungry together. It wasn't until 1817, when Chaska was about seven years old, that another group of Wasiku came up the Mississippi River to talk again about the fort. In July, Major Stephen Long and his men rode past the burial ground for Kaposia's dead on the west bank of the Mississippi and then past the village to the east. Long didn't spend much time in the area, but he did choose a site on a high bluff overlooking the place where the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers come together. Two years later, a bigger group arrived, ready at last to build the frontier fort. Major Thomas Forsyth, a gray-haired man who had spent much of his life working with Indians, was sent to talk with the Dakota. It was late July by the time he arrived at Kaposia. Chaska was probably there when Forsyth met with Sentan Wakamani. Forsyth reported that Sentan Wakamani was a steady, generous, and independent Indian. We don't know what Chaska or Sentan Wakanmani thought of Forsyth, but we do know what Forsyth told the, told the Dakota. The President of the United States, the Great Father, had sent him and the troops. The Dakota, or Sioux, he assured them, must not think that anything bad was intended. A fort would answer two purposes for the Sioux. First, it would be a place that any little thing that they might want repaired by the blacksmith would be done for them. It was also a place of trade. Secondly, their enemies would not be allowed to injure any of the Sioux Indians at or near the fort. Forsyth handed out gifts to Sentan Wakanmani and other leaders along the Mississippi and Minnesota rivers. But because he liked Sentan Wakanmani so much, 
and because Kaposia was a village closest to the new fort, Forsyth gave the biggest gifts to Chaska's people. Forsyth's report on the Dakota probably impressed Major Lawrence Talibert, who arrived at the fort that same year in 1819. Talibert was the new Indian agent. He was supposed to explain to Dakota leaders the policy of the U.S. government, and he was to try to keep the peace between the Dakota and their new Wasiku neighbors. He also hoped to bring about peace between the Dakota and their longtime enemies to the north, the Ojibwe. Young men and boys like Tra Chaska dreamed of proving their bravery and skill as warriors by fighting the Ojibwe, but the U.S. government wanted peace on Indian lands. Talavere never stopped the Dakota and Ojibwe from fighting, but he did keep the whites around the fort and their Dakota neighbors from shooting each other. He was proud to take credit for this, but Talavere's success depended on leaders like Senten Wakanmani. Chaska's grandfather liked the Indian agent, even though this Wasiku had a way of thinking too much of himself. The leader, his son, and Chaska often visited Talavere at his house just outside the stone walls of the new fort. Sentenwakanmani never left the agent's house without first saying, My father, I take you by your hand. And he rarely left without first having a drink of whiskey. Chaska knew about the Wasiku drink whiskey long before he met Talavere. The same traders who sold the Dakota blankets and guns also sold them Miniwakan, or spirit water, as the Dakota sometimes called the drink. When Dakota boys played white men, using white clay to paint their face and moss for beards, they always had water on hand to stand for whiskey. Chaska traded furs for sips of water, for bags of sugar that looked more like sand, and for ground up earth that was meant to look like gunpowder. But real Minowakan was no game. In more than one Dakota village, men had to tie drunken warriors to the poles of a lodge at night to keep them from destroying things as they roared around in the dark. By the time Chaska was a teenager, even Sentawakan Dakmani was drinking more than he should. Perhaps in part because of the leader's drinking, people began to leave Kaposia for other villages in the 1820s. The deer and other game that had been so plentiful in years past seemed to be hiding somewhere in the big woods to the west. Kaposia's hunters and hunters in other Dakota villages were finding it harder to find game to kill for food and furs. At the same time, local traders were raising prices on goods in their stores. It couldn't have been easy for Chaska to watch his village grow smaller and smaller over the years. It couldn't have been easy to watch his own grandfather stumble around drunk. It couldn't have been easy to feel hunger in his stomach when he and other hunters failed to find enough game to carry their families through the winter. Sometime in the late 1820s or early 1830s, Chaska earned a new name, a name fit for a man. Teo Yate Duta, his red nation, was a good name for a leader of a people. But Teo Tate Duta wasn't sure that Kaposia was a good place to lead from. It seemed as if the villagers were scattering far and wide through the woods. What chance was there here to find glory, respect, or power? Teo Yate Duta decided to follow the others, leaving his village and his people behind. <laughs>